excited that one person is here and his name is the Holy Spirit. Are you excited that he inhabits our praises? I love that promise. I love that. Lord, come and do what only you can do. God, we love you. We praise you tonight. Holy Spirit, fill this place. Be glorified. Be lifted high in our hearts, Lord. We love you, Jesus. Change hearts and minds and do what only you can do. In Jesus' name, amen.
faithful. Amen. He is glorious. He is high and lifted up. He is Jesus. Let's worship him. All right. Woo. And I 
praise your holy name, Jesus. We lift up our banner and we proclaim the name of Jesus. There's no name higher. Through all the highs, through all the lows, you are there, God. And we bless you and we live for you. Amen.
everyone. Praise God. Father, we love you tonight. We're so glad to be a part of your family. So glad to know you. So glad to honor you. So glad to magnify you. So glad you loved us. We have not lost the awe that you loved us. When we were yet in our sin, you loved us. You commended your love toward us while we were yet sinners that Christ died for us. We love you greatly tonight, Lord. I just feel like loving the Lord. Anybody feel like just loving the Lord tonight? Come on, just lift your hands and your voice. Come on, let's just love on him a minute. Oh, thank you, Lord. I love you so much, Master. I love you so much. I'm not ashamed to say I love you, Lord. Oh, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness to me, your grace to me, your kindness your predictability, your stability, your faithfulness, Lord. Oh, I love you tonight, Master. I love you tonight, Master. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You can be seated. Praise God. Wow, that worship team did a job, didn't they? I got, I got so excited in worship, I, I'm thinking, why in the world did my wife give me a vested suit? I'm in St. Simon's, Georgia. I got excited in worship. I said, I'm coming out of this coat. Besides that, if, if nothing else during praise and worship tonight blessed you, if you will watch the bass player, your life will become joyous. I'm telling you, if you can't be happy watching that bass player, I want to tell you something, bud. I'm a child of the, I'm a teenager of the 60s, and we would say, you know how to bust a move. Come on, you know, I'm telling you. You say, hey, you know what, I tell you, if you go to some places that, that, that go on, some people just get upset. But how many people are grateful you got delivered from religion, got into relationship with Jesus? And big difference, man. I just, uh, wow, I'm telling you, you just, uh, you got it going on, man. If, I hope you're not that good on the golf course, my Lord. You know, i got to come in on that song. I just That song blesses me so much. When you get to that, you have no rival. I mean, that just goes all over me. You have no rival. 
You have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name above all names. And the phrase that came to my mind, I said it the other day, and I don't know if I've heard it from somebody else probably, and it just came back in my memory, but this idea of dualism, the idea of dualism, there's a big God and a big devil, and they're fighting it out, is absolute nonsense. It is nonsense. And this phrase came to my mind, the devil is a mouse with a microphone. That's what he is. You say, well, Brother Mike, you, you need to give the devil his due. Well, the Bible says he's due hell, so let's give it to him. That's, that's, it, it was made for him. And uh, I found out, compared to my Lord, the devil and demons and all that stuff, I don't, I don't worry a lot about devils and demons. I'm more interested in my stupid zones. I've discovered my stupid zones. Now, I'm, none of you have those, but I need to find out what I don't know because I don't go into captivity because of a demon. I don't go into captivity. I go into captivity for a lack of knowledge. The Bible says principality, power, might, and dominion in every demonic title conferred. It's five levels. You shouldn't have sung that song. i got to get to this. It's five levels of demonic authority in the earth. And Ephesians 1 says they are all under the feet of Jesus. And that we are seated with him and we are his body. And so that means if you're the last little, this is the prelim event before the main event. If you're the last piece of flaky little epidermic skin on the bottom of the foot of the body of Christ. Principality, power, might, and dominion, and title is under your feet. So quit worrying about the devil and just understand that if God be for us, nobody can be against us. Well, praise God. You're a wonderful group to minister to, and I'm honored to be here. I thank God for leaders, and all of you are leaders, whether you know it or not. You need to discover that. I, I hear people all the time, well, there's full-time ministers, part of No, we're all full-time leaders in the kingdom of God. You may be in five-fold ministry or you may be in discipleship ministry, but we're all leaders. And we all have circles of influence. And so we've been talking about the need for unity, empowering people through unity. And I'm going to pick up where I left off this morning. If you weren't here this morning, you'll be able to get the tapes of the download, or the, the CDs, rather, and the download. And uh, you'll be able to keep up, but we're going to start fresh there. Father, we love you tonight. We're ready to receive your word. We'll be aggressive receivers, and we'll be ready doers of your word in Jesus' name. God's people said amen. amen. I'm giving a lot more material in this leadership conference than I would uh, if I was just speaking in a church. And, uh, but I train leaders in churches too. But I recognize that there is a high level of leadership ability in this room. And I, I really want to deal with that. I don't think there's a lot of teaching on the subject of unity. I think we all want it. We talk about it. But I don't know that there's a lot of teaching about it. And so I want to share some things the Lord has given me. This morning we started, and I'll get to the first PowerPoint in a minute, but I'll just review the last few. How do you establish and maintain unity? Number one, remember we all came from the same sin through the same grace into the same body. Amen? And if you remember that we all came through the same grace from the same sin, we are all been born into the same body, it ought to be easy for us to stay unified. Number two, humble ourselves into a location of submission instead of exalting ourselves to a position of promotion. Can I hear an amen? The location, remember, the location of submission brings you to the position of promotion. If you try to get to position, God will bring you into a lower location. But if you'll locate the lower location, God will promote you to a better position. And then number next, that's what you say when you lose count. Number three, you need to prefer others. Prefer others. The book of Romans says, with loving kindness, brotherly love, in honor, preferring one another. And those of you that are here this morning remembered that I showed what that Greek word meant. 
that he's behind me, but if I in love and preference, the Greek word prefer means to take by the hand, lead forward before you, and push him ahead. That's what that means. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't see a lot of that in the American church. See a lot of that, that in the American church. I see a lot of the competition in the American church. We need to be pushing the next generation forward. We need to be pushing people forward, leading them forward, preferring. And I don't have a lot of time to teach on this tonight, but my friend, we need to understand that there are some people in the church can do things better than we can. I mean, that's a real revelation. But there's some folk that have a greater gifting in certain areas than we have. So know when to step back and take somebody else by the hand and lead them forward and let the gift that is necessary and the best move forward. Covet earnestly the best gifts. Well, that's about the charisma gifts. Well, what's the best gifts? Is one better than the other? No, it's what is needed in the situation. Sometimes, even in motivational gifts, sometimes you need an administrator, somebody that can cross a T and dot an I. But there are other times that you need an encourager. There are other times that you need a giver. There are other times you need prophetic. So, folks, all of us are not assigned to everybody. If you'd receive that, that would take a lot of load off. You are not assigned to everybody. Don't try to be assigned to everybody. Discover that fact and prefer your brethren. No, I could teach a lot on that, but we talk about preferring others. Now we'll pick up where we left off. Recognize the needed anointings in streams other than you. And we talked about that a little bit today. Recognize the needed anointings in streams that are other than your own stream. Psalm 46, 4, there is a river, one, the streams, plural, make glad the city of God. There's one river, but there are many streams. Ephesians 4, 16 says, whom the whole body fitly joint together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth. Watch this. According to the effectual working in the measure of every part makes the body increase and edifies itself in love. There's more streams than your stream. I love the FCMI stream, but you're not the only stream. I love the faith stream, but it's not the only stream. There's, there's a story told, you know, somebody died and went to heaven and St. Peter met him. I can't even imagine Peter watching a gate. But they always have St. Peter at the gate. And St. Peter meets them and uh, takes them through. And they go into one room, and there's a lot of people in there, and they're sprinkling each other with water, sprinkling each other. And the guy said to Peter, who is that? And they said, well, that's a saved Methodist. And they went to another room, and there were people dipping people one right after. Who's that? That's a saved Baptist. They went into another room, and there were people just dancing in the spirit before the Lord and praising God and said, who's that? And he said, well, shh. Be quiet, that's the same Pentecostals. They think they're the only ones here. <laughs> and you know what, folks? Sometimes we get so individualistic, we think our stream's the only stream. No other stream has anything to offer. I'm sitting with a young son of mine at breakfast, and I'm giving him some strong advice that he really needed in making a major decision. And he looked at me, and he made this statement. He said, I just can't see that. I said, obviously. That's why I'm having breakfast with you. I can see that. What you need is in somebody else. What you need is in somebody else. Brother Mike, I'm going to get it through the Holy Ghost. Let me tell you how the Holy Ghost gives you what you need. 95% of the time, he does it through another person in your life. When God wants to bless you, he brings a person into your life. When Satan wants to curse you, he brings a person into your life. Understand, and it doesn't have to be an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. It could be somebody at Starbucks. 
It could be somebody you're having coffee with, and they say one sentence, and they don't even realize it, but it's a word of wisdom. It's a word of knowledge. Come on, folks. We don't have to blow a trumpet to operate in the gifts of the Spirit. We ought to have that as a normal way of life. I need all of the streams in the river to flow on me. You know, if you're a traveling minister, you'd have to learn the law of adaptation pretty quick. You'd have to learn that. And recognize, and this is the, diff- the next one, recognize or understand diversity and difference is a strength, not a weakness. Understand that diversity and difference is a strength, not a weakness. We're all diverse. We're all different. We talked about this this morning. If you're a traveling minister, and I've pastored churches, taught in Bible college, done a lot of things, but I've been traveling for now 20 years, 20 years around the world since the last place I was staying. <laughs> and uh, if you travel, you have to learn the law of adaptation. What is that? I go into some churches and they're worshiping God in high anthem music. And they love God, and they're worshiping Him in spirit and truth. And it sounds like an opera. I preach my voice out. I've been in South Africa where they want you to preach three hours every time you preach. So my voice is gone, so I can't illustrate. But they'll be singing, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. And it's, you know, All hail the power of Jesus' Name. Let angels prostrate fall. And you're sitting there thinking, Oh, God couldn't be in that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's their stream. That's their stream. And they're worshiping God in spirit and truth. No, they're stuck. Mm -mm. You're stuck in not being able to recognize their stream. That's their stream. They're worshiping God that way. So when I'm there, I don't say, well, I'm not into that. I like the stuff, you know, that we, I like when the bass player goes all over the place. I I don't do that. I just adapt. Why? Because I want to be able to flow my stream on their stream. Because if two streams meet, we just multiplied. One can put a thousand to flight. Two can put ten thousand to flight. So I'm not going to dishonor their stream. So I just get with it, you know. Bring forth the royal diadem. I don't have a voice. And crawl. I'm not even going to do that. <clears throat> I'd blow my voice. And the next week I'll be in a church that just discovered the Davidic tabernacle. And everything's in a minor key. It all sounds Jewish. There's 14 shofars. Come on, how many know? There's 14 shofars and only two know how to play them. Come on, am I the only one? You know, you know. Blow the shofar. (laughs) It's not happening, you know. Come on, it's all right. We have a little joy tonight. You know, there's, and and tambourines are everywhere. (laughs) You don't play a tambourine on Amazing Grace. It doesn't work. Even if it sounds Jewish, it doesn't work. But I just get with it, you know. And they're dancing to everything, you know. Jehovah Jireh my provider, and they're trying to dance. And if it's a white congregation, obviously they can't. (laughs) They all look like they're from Ireland, you know, and we're, so what do I do? Do I just say, huh, I don't like this stream. No, baby, I just get in the minor key, and I get with the program. Why? That's their stream. Come on, y'all receiving this? Next week, I'll be in a country church. I was in a church in North Nashville years ago, 500 people in it, the, the praise and worship leader came out. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. He had a gray beard, long hair. It was in pigtails. If you'd have put a red bandana on him, he was playing an acoustic guitar. He was Holy Ghost Willie. <laughs> and his voice sounded like that. And they sang a song I'd never heard before, never heard since. It was country as cornbread. And they sang this song. Here's the way it's, if I can remember it. And his voice. He's still in business. He's still in business. 
He's not retired, old or gray. He is still the same today. He's still in business. You say, that's crazy. God can't move in that. Oh, no, don't judge their stream. Just jump in with them. Jump in the stream. You understand? I got to get off this illustration. We're having too much fun. Years ago, I'll give you a woman. Years ago, I was in Washington, D.C., a predominantly African-American church. 800 people there. <laughs> and I don't know anything about sing preaching. That's not in my culture. But, but African Americans can get into sing preaching. And uh, how many have discovered the Holy Spirit won't always tell you what he's getting ready to do through you? And I'm just preaching and everything's good and the people are with me. And I got over to Isaiah chapter 1 where I said, you know, come now let us reason together. Say the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they'll be white as snow and so forth. And I got down there and it came out this way. And though your sins be as scarlet. And I inside I'm going, no, 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 no. I know the Spirit's supposed to be subject to the prophet, but it was coming out that way. And I'm thinking, oh, they're going to be offended. They're going to think I'm trying to do this. And I was rebuking my spirit. I was taking charge. And the Lord was chuckling in heaven and saying, I've got it. And it came out. They shall be white as snow. And a lady ran up and got on the organ and went, come on. You know, wow. We get to heaven, there'll be an African-American playing a B3 Hammond. And the women in the church started standing up and pointing at me like this. And I started looking like everything okay. And I, I sang preach for five minutes. I tried to stop and I couldn't stop. You know what? That's what their stream was. And the Lord wanted my stream to blend with their stream. The next night, I had 14 rows of African-American young people, teenagers, middle center, middle section, 14 rows. And I was preaching on fatalism. And I said, don't get into fatalism. And I pulled out this old song. I said, like the old Doris Day song, que sera, sera. Come on, anybody remember? Whatever will be, will be. Okay, you all know it. And, and these 14 rows of kids are looking at me like, is the white boy speaking in tongues or what? I mean, they had no idea. They didn't know that crazy song, you know. And the Lord spoke to me, and uh, you may think I'm crazy, but if I am, don't rehabilitate me. I like to do what the Lord says. And the Lord said, They're not, you're not communicating to those 14 rows. He said, do it this way. And I, I, I said, well, I don't know how to. He said, I'll help you. And so he came out this way. I said, well, you kids would probably say it this way. Que sera, sera, what will be, will be. You see, the future's not really ours to see. But if you trust the Lord and you'll walk his way, he'll lead and guide you every day. You know, I was about 50 years old and white, but I got with their stream. Come on. You understand? I become all things to all men that by all means I might win some. My stream's not the only stream. Come on, somebody. Come on, let's humble ourselves enough to adapt. The ear doesn't say to the eye because you don't hear, I don't have any need of you, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The hand doesn't say to the foot because you don't, you don't pick up things. I don't need you. That's why God has put things in the body the way he wants. Recognize the difference is a good thing. Diversity is a good thing. There's diversity of gifts, but the self-same spirit. Difference is an operation, but the same Lord. Amen? Hallelujah. Glory to God. Next, how do you establish unity and maintain it? This is so big in me. Think with a kingdom mind rather than a church mind. Now, don't, please don't get offended at what I'm, what I'm about to say. I believe in the church. I love the church. Jesus is building his church. We are co-laborers in the church. Jesus died for the church. But can I remind you in the four gospels when he was here on earth, he only mentioned church twice. 
he talked about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven 120 sometimes. We like to preach the king. We just don't like to teach what the king taught. The king talked about the kingdom. And as soon as you say that, and I don't feel that in this crowd, but if you say it in some crowds, oh, I had one guy say, you're not in the kingdom now. I said, wait a minute. I said, the kingdom is now. And the kingdom was then. And the kingdom will be in the future. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven is past, present, and future simultaneously. It's still in the past. You say, well, it's not here now. The kingdom won't be here till Jesus comes. Do you know that's what most people in our churches believe? The kingdom won't come until the king comes. Whoa, 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 whoa. Jesus said, the kingdom is within you. Paul said, kingdom is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Well, how many people here have been made righteous by the blood? How many of you have the joy of the Lord? How many of you have the peace of God? How many of you here have the Holy Spirit dwelling within you? Well, you're in the kingdom. The kingdom is in you. It came when the king came. Repent, he said, for the kingdom is here. It's at hand. Then he said, the kingdom is in you. And then he said, the kingdom will come in its fullness when he returns. No, I don't believe in kingdom now theology that says, we're going to create a paradise on the earth and everyone's going to get saved. And until we do that, the Lord can't come back. The Bible doesn't teach that. But folks, we, we've got to have a kingdom. And I can't stay on this long and I'm tempted. You have to have a kingdom mentality rather than a church mentality. Because, and I love the church. Man, I've been in the church all my life. I love the church. I'm not demeaning the church. Maybe I ought to use the word religious. But, but the church mind and the kingdom mind think totally different. I've got 35 differences between the kingdom mind and the church mind. Maybe tomorrow I'll give some of them. They think totally different. Think about this. Put the next one up. If uh, I think that I've got this. The church mind can always change churches. But a kingdom mind has no other option. There's a multitude of different churches. But there's only one kingdom of God. Come on, think about this. Well, I don't like what's going on in the church, so I'll just change church. Well, you can't say that with the kingdom. There's either the kingdom of darkness or the kingdom of light. And if you change kingdoms, you're in big trouble. The church mentality. The church mentality is survival. Let's hold on till Jesus comes. The kingdom mentality is expansion. The church mentality is inward. The kingdom mentality is out. The, king, the church mentality is, is insight, but the kingdom mentality is influence. What am I saying? God wants us to get out of the church and into the marketplace and into sports. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Holy Ghost filled, you know. Tongue-talking, spirit-filled, born-again, blood-bought quarterbacks. In the NFC, I'm a Dallas fan. It's hard, but I am. I'm a Dallas fan. We're doing pretty good this year. But in the AFC, I was raised in Kansas City, and I'm a Chiefs fan. And uh, we have had a long drought. But Patrick Mahomes came to town. And uh, most people don't know this, but he goes to an Assembly of God church. Now, he can't go on Sundays during the, during the season, but he goes to an Assembly of God church. He's a spirit-filled young man. And last year before the season, he went up to the pastor and said, would you pray for me over, over our season this year that we'll just have a good season? And he didn't know it, but the pastor called him up publicly and said, hold your hands out. He said, I want to anoint your hands with oil. He anointed his hands with oil and said, Lord, bless these hands that it could have influence in the kingdom of God. He did okay. 57 touchdown passes and the most valuable player of the league. Yeah. You know what he's doing now? He goes to the end zone before the game starts and kneels down and prays. And he doesn't pray, God help us win. He says, God help us to play the best we can and the other team to play the best they can and keep us all safe from injury and give us a good game. So then two or three other players from the Chiefs went. 
Now there's about 15 or 16 chief players that go kneel down with the cameras on. I'm sure the NFL will try to prohibit it soon. You know, it's okay to kneel. Here's, here's the mindset. Now, come on, I hope I don't get in trouble on this. But you know what, folks? I kneel for the cross and I stand for the flag. That's what I do. And I don't consider it a racial thing. Doesn't have, it doesn't have anything to do with color except red. There was red shed on the cross for my liberty. There was red shed for the flag for my liberty. So I kneel at the cross and I stand for the flag. That's what I do. Do you understand? I don't have time to deal with this. But folks, we got we to gotta start thinking like Havanians. <laughs> People go, huh? Havanians. I opened that can of worms, and I'll have to close it. I was, I was writing on an application. It was government. I forgot what it was years ago, something you had to fill out. And it said, I love this, it said, it said ethnicity. And then it had a bunch of boxes, European American, African American, Native American, Asian American, had a bunch of them. And then it had a box, and it said other. And it said, if other, explain. I wanted to check that box so bad. I don't know if you can tell, but I got a little ornery in me. You know, you know what ornery is. You know. I wanted to check that box. I wanted to check other and then put under it, Hevanian American. I'm of the kingdom of heaven. So I'm a Hevanian. I'm a Hevanian American. Not a European American. Not an African American. I'm an Hevanian American. So what I'm trying to say is the church is trying to sit in the church and wait for Jesus to come. I believe he's coming, but he didn't say vegetate until I come. He said occupy until I come. And that means move out of the church and take the kingdom to the marketplace. Take the kingdom to the educational system. Take the kingdom to government. I'm right now mentoring senators, some senators that pray in the Spirit every morning. I'm right now mentoring some young House of Representative men. Shh, don't tell anybody. He said, what are you doing? I had one guy said that, and he came up and said, well, it just sounds like you Christians are trying to take over. I said, bingo, baby. So what? What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? Free country. I said, free country. Well, Brother Mike, you know, we just need to, we just need to wait till Jesus comes. He'll come right on time. Occupy. Come on, say that word. Occupy. Say it again. Occupy. Please say it again. Occupy. Don't think just in a church mind. Church people think I gave it and I lost it. Kingdom people think I sowed it and I'll get a harvest. Church people think giving. Kingdom people think investing. How many know I'd like to teach more on that, but I'm not going to take the time. Y'all still with me? Next. How do you, how do you, how do you create unity and maintain it? Establish a culture of honor. I've written two books on honor, Reclaiming the Lost Diamond of Honor and 31 Pillars of Honor. If you're interested in any of our resources, you can go to strengthandwisdomministries.com. I didn't bring any with me, but uh, they are books that uh, are in government offices. They're in churches. They're in Bible schools. They're in business places. It will help you. Our nation needs to reclaim the lost diamond of honor. We don't even understand respect like we should in our nation anymore. I don't care who the president is. If he's Republican or Democrat, no president deserves the attack the current one is under. It's insanity. Whether you're for him or against him, I mean, it is it has gone beyond the pale. I mean, just you just crazy stuff. I mean, I, I, I would have said the same thing about Barack Obama. Come on, he's the president. He's the president. The office deserves respect. I, I, hear, I hear the way children talk to their parents in America today. Wow. No. Oh, my Lord. I'm thinking. <laughs> I was in Walmart. I, I try to go to Walmart twice a year. 
I love that Walmart's a great place, but I just, it's not like what I like to do. But I was picking up something for Karen years ago, and I was in the, it was in the vegetable aisle, the canned vegetable aisle. And I'm trying to get out of there and get what she wanted on her list. And this little kid, eight years old or so, is taking cans off and rolling them down the aisle like a bowling ball. And his mom and dad are there, and his mom comes over and says, now we don't do that. And you know what that little kid did? He said, no, and took a can and threw it at her. Now, Dad is standing over here, and I'm thinking, I'm going to slow down and read the labels because this is going to be entertaining. I want to see what happens here. Dad comes over, and his little squeaky voice said, now, son, we don't do that. And if you do that, when we get home, we'll have to give you a timeout. I'm thinking, shoot, my dad would have taken timeout right there. I mean, wait till you, he'd have taken a timeout. I mean, the only difference would have been you throw green beans at his wife, and you're going to wonder if you're going to sail between the W and the A or the L and the M. But you're going for a trip, man. Come on. We've lost the attitude of respect. We, we do much less honor. I watch the way husbands talk to their wives in public, and I shudder. I would never talk to my wife that way in public. Woman! Who do you think you are? I'm shocked at that. She's not just my woman, she's my queen. Next to the Holy Spirit, she's the greatest gift God ever gave me. She is perfect for me. God gave her to me not to have somebody to cook my meals and wash my clothes. I can hire that. I can get that done somewhere else. He's, God gave her to me so I could have someone to love the way Jesus loves the church. And so I could protect her and promote her and provide for her. I love and I watch men talk to their wives like they're dogs. And equal time. I watch women talk to their men like they are idiots. In fact, if you watch TV today, commercials all make look men look like babbling fools. You know, you go in and this guy's got pins all over trying to decide what kind of car to buy. And the little lady walks in and says, I found it on a nap. Here it is. <laughs> and he goes, ooh, ooh, ooh. You know, we're really not that stupid, ladies. <laughs> you know, and it's just the demasculization of men in America is amazing. No wonder our younger generation doesn't know what bathroom to go in. Come on, somebody. Right? Having an identity crisis in that arena. I would never, my, my wife would never talk to me that way. Come on. If I come in here and I'm at St. Simon's Island Christian Renewal, when we're sitting around, it's Mike and Mike. But when I'm in here, Pastor Mike. What? Well, God's not into titles. He gave five of them. I know he doesn't need the title, and you can do however you want with that, but I want to show my respect. I want to show my honor. This is the way I do it. And if you want to have unity, you must establish in your church, in your home, in your family, in your ministry, in your business, you must establish a culture of honor. And it doesn't happen accidentally in this culture. You have to establish it. Let me give you a few things. I'm going to do it quick. Honor is the vertical golden rule. You've heard the golden rule, do unto others you would have them do unto you. Honor is the vertical golden rule. You do unto God the way you would have God do unto you. He said in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 30, them that honor me, that's vertical, I will honor. So if you want mercy, you, you honor the God of mercy. He honors you with mercy. You want grace, you honor the God of grace. He honors you with grace. Number two, honor is the action produced by the attitude of respect. Honor is the attitude or the action produced by the attitude of respect. Respect is the caterpillar. Honor is the butterfly. I'm moving fast. You still with me? Say amen. Leaders, listen to this. The many follow, but the few honor. The many follow, but the few honor. 
And if people don't honor the anointing in your life, you will be limited in what you can do for them. Now, almost nobody will teach this because, because the current concept is we're all the same. No, we're not. Well, we're all on the same level. No, we're not. No, we're not. There's people in here in areas that know much more than I know. I am not on his level when it comes to accounting. In fact, I can't understand. I see two accountants here at least tonight. And I can't understand how they maintain their sanity. Because just getting the material ready to give to my accountant for taxes drives me insane. I don't drink, but I'd consider it. I'm kidding, okay? I'm kidding. He's better than me at that. No doubt about it. He's better than me at that. He's better than me. I'm a bassist, but I can't do what he does while he's playing the bass. Yeah, I mean, we're laughing a little bit tonight, but come on, guys. We're not all the same. I hear people say, we're all on the same level in the church. Then who's going to lift you up? If everybody's on the same level, how's anybody going to move up? That's why God gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers for the perfecting of the saints, the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ till we all come into the unity of faith under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ that we wouldn't be children anymore tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Why? Because apostles lift us up in one way. Prophets lift us up in another. Usually they knock us down, then they lift us up. Teachers, we need it. We need mentors. Many will follow you, but few will honor what's in you. You'll have come and seers that just come and see what you're about. You'll have follow meers, people that want to follow you. You'll have be with meers, people that will be with you. But you'll have go for meers, people you can send for you. And you know what determines where they're at? Their degree of honor to the anointing that is within you. Grab a hold of that. Throw the other one up real fast. Recognition of identity is the multiplier of honor. Is this too much? We all right? We all right? Recognition of identity is the multiplier of honor. Now, to use this example, this man's already in heaven, but let's imagine he was still here. If you don't recognize who a person is, you won't honor them very much. But watch this. Uh, um, let's see, a South Carolina, I, I think it's North. Let's just say Carolinian. A Carolinian is going to be in here in 15 minutes. As a Carolinian is going to visit us. Well, nobody got excited about that. Okay, great, a Carolinian's coming. He, he was raised on a farm. Raised on a farm. A Carolinian raised on a farm. Well, good, he's welcome, he's welcome. He can come to FCMI. Yeah, and uh, he, he, had, he has a beautiful wife by the name of Ruth. Oh, now I'm seeing smiles starting. A few people are beginning to recognize the identity of this mystery guest. Uh, he's a Baptist, but he's a great Baptist. He's a great Baptist. He's prayed with presidents, a lot of them. His first name's Billy. Now, everybody in the house knows that he's not just a Carolinian, he's not just raised on a farm, he's not just somebody married to Ruth. He's not just a Baptist. He's not somebody who's just met a few presidents. But he's Billy Graham, the great evangelist of grace. And if he was still here on the earth, just to hear a Carolinian was coming wouldn't cause us to want to honor. Just to hear somebody but that married Ruth wouldn't want to cause us. But, but when we heard Billy Graham, everybody would say, oh, how long till he's going to be here in 10 minutes? And people would be turning around and watching. And when he walked in, everybody would stand and applaud for the great evangelist of grace. Why? Recognition of identity increases and multiplies the honor. That's why husbands don't honor their wives. They don't really know who she is. Come on, ladies. That would have been good time for you to say amen. Come on. Have a little courage. They, 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 they've got to know who she is. That's why wives sometimes don't honor their husbands. They don't know. This, 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 isn't, this isn't the guy you're assigned to nag into an early grave. 
Hello. Come on, I got you. I got the guys before. Now, ladies, it's your turn. You understand? When we understand who we are, the more I get to know this man. I, he's old, but he's contemporary. <laughs> he's not that old. I love his glasses. I bragged on his glasses today. He's got the contemporary glasses, like from the 40s. <laughs> How many have noticed what goes around comes around? But the more I know his wife, the more I'd want to honor her. The more I know this man, the more I'd want to honor him. Do you understand? That's why we need unity. We need to get to know one another. Come on, somebody. We don't need just to run across one another's paths, be ships passing in the night. We need to know one another. And as we know one another, we'll, we'll honor next. Put the next one up. Honor is the master key that will open any door. If you'll create this culture in your church or your business, your whole life will change. Honor is the master key. It'll open any door. If I honor an atheist, he'll let me in. He doesn't believe what I believe, but if I find something to honor about him. Come on, somebody. You honor, it opens doors. Find something to honor. Next. God's response to honor is extravagant. God's response to dishonor is extreme. Get a hold of that. If you'll honor God, he'll be extravagant with you. I mean, but why? Because it's so rare. Them that honor me, I will honor. The Hebrew says, them that heap honor upon me, will I heap honor back upon them. You want God, how many here want God's blessings? Create a culture of honor. Did you notice what I did last night when I stood beside Pastor Mike and we started the conference? I really didn't, wasn't going to preach last night. He just told me to tell a little bit what I was going to do. But I took him by the hand. I had you stand. And what did I do? I honored the Holy Spirit. Lord, you're the CEO of this meeting, FCMI. We want to do everything you want us to do. I honor this man who's the leader right now of the conference. I honor the leadership. I honor the anointings that are here. Why was I doing that? Because what you honor moves towards you. What you dishonor moves away from you. Just works that way. We're going to have unity. We're going to have to do that. Next one. A covenant, of, a covenant of honor is the strongest bond. A covenant of honor. There would be, there would be no divorce. None. In the body of Christ, if we honored appropriately. None. What about adultery? You won't commit adultery if you honor your wife. You won't commit adultery if you honor your husband. If two, if two Christians know how to honor one another in a marriage and honor God, that bond can be eternal. Now, I'm not, I'm not killing, I'm not beating on divorcees, but I'm just telling you, my friend, I understand the pain that divorces bring and all the rest of it, and God is a good God, and he forgives, and there's life afterwards, and I know all of that, and that's another subject. I'm using it for an illustration. If we really knew how to honor one another, that wouldn't be an option. We really knew how to honor one another. There'd be no church splits if we knew how to honor. There'd be, there'd be no racism if we knew how to honor. We don't know how to honor. So how are you going to have unity if we don't honor each other? I don't know what some of you are thinking. And they rubbed me the wrong way. Get the CD from this morning. When I told about the cat and you're rubbing the cat. Come on, folks. That's all right. Just turn. The cat doesn't like it. The cat can turn around. Come on. We're, we're going to be together. Amen? Praise God. Y'all still with me? Say amen. I got just a little time left. Can I give you just a little bit more? You receiving anything? I'm going to anyway, but I love enthusiasm. Praise the Lord. Stay unified with. Next subject. Stay unified with. You probably have to switch over to tonight. I don't know where you are. But I want to talk about some things to stay unified with and a few things, and I'll pick it up tomorrow after I'm done. I'm not boring you, am I? We okay tonight? We're leadership level. Amen? Okay. What do we need to stay unified with? Stay unified, number one, with the body of Christ. Stay unified with the body of Christ. There aren't any lone rangers. Even the Lone Ranger had Tonto. 
We need one another. We need one another. If you have a prophetic motivational gift, I didn't say if you're a prophet, you might be in the office of a prophet, but you can have a prophetic motivational gift and not be in the office of a prophet. And if you have a prophetic motivational gift, you've got to be careful because you will, you will think you can do so much on your own. And prophetically motiv motivated people can do a lot on their own, but they, they isolate themselves. And uh, what prophetically motivated people will not tell you, I have 21 characteristics, personality characteristics of the prophetically motivated person. And what most people won't tell you is, let me show you what I mean. Prophetically motivated people are bold enough to invade hell with a squirt gun. That's how bold they are. Prophetically motivated people, it's right, wrong, left, right, now or never. Prophetically motivated people would never make a good secretary of state. They're a secretary of defense. And as soon as they got in the secretary of defense department, they'd change it to the secretary of war. That's prophetically motivated people. And we need them. Now, we don't need a lot of them. <laughs> That's true. Prophetically motivated people are the jalapenos and the habaneros. And you can't have a full diet of it. But we need them for spice. We need them for fire. But what they don't tell you is prophetically motivated people are the most subject to depression. Because prophetically motivated people never think they do it well enough. I shouldn't have you even open this, I guess, but there, there are seven motivational gifts in Romans chapter 12. God places a primary motivational gift and a secondary while you're in your mother's womb. That's one of the reasons God hates abortion. It's not just the taking of a human life. It's the dishonoring of the gifts he intended to come into the earth. And that motivational gift he places in you, and I prove it from the scripture, I don't have time. That motivational gift he places in you while you were in your mother's womb determines your personality more than heredity and environment. It can be used for good or it can be used for bad. My primary motivational gift is prophetic. My secondary motivational gift is teaching. My wife's primary is mercy. Her secondary is exhortation or encouragement. Oh, perfect. What I don't have, she has. What she doesn't have, I have. And I know how to prefer her, and she knows how to prefer me. Come on. But prophetically motivated people. I've been preaching 52 years. When I walk out of here tonight, there will be this thought cross my mind. I spent too much time on that point. I could have said that better. Maybe I should have. Now, I don't stay in it too long. Because then I'll get discouraged. I, but I realize that's one of the weaknesses. Come on, folks. Your strength can become your weakness. You have to understand that. Come on, this is a good group. I'm saying some things here I don't just normally say in churches. You understand? And you've got to understand that. You need the body. You need the body. Mercy people need prophetic people. Why? Because mercy people would give Lucifer another chance. And mercy people will get abused if there's not prophetic people around. Because prophetic people can smell a skunk before they see them. Come on. That's why, you know, back when they were doing all the telemarketing, thank God we kind of got rid of a lot of that now. They send emails now. But anyway, the telemarketing, and they always call it supper time. You ever notice they always call it supper time? You know, and the phone rings so you know, and if it calls, and we don't recognize the number, I don't let Karen answer that. It's what voicemail's for. And especially, it's probably a telemarketer. And if Mercy, if Miss Mercy answers the phone, we're going to buy magazines. <laughs> Here, here's Karen. I don't think we want any. Oh, that's all right. Uh, oh, you're, you're saving money to go to college? Really? Wow. Oh, I see you're a single mother. Okay. Well, uh, what do we need to do? And I'm over here going, no. 
No, no, no. It's not a single mother. She's not a single mother. She's not going to college. She's a con. <laughs> and, and usually that it's a line they're playing. You know. So I just say, give the phone to me, give the phone to me, give the phone to me. And she'll give the phone to me, and I'll say, I'll say, hello. I'm glad to know that you're in sales. I've studied sales myself. To be successful in sales, you have to determine the number of no's to get to your next yes. I'm going to help you get to your next yes. No. <laughs> prophetic people. But prophetic people need the others in the body of Christ. We need mercy people. We need encouragement people. We need administrative people. You need people. You need the body. You need the body. Stay unified with the body. So, Brother Mike, I'll tell you, there's just no church. Have you ever heard this? There's just no church. Good enough. I just haven't found enough. If you're pastoring, I hope you're not saying that. But I have hear people, they're just, I just can't find a church spiritual enough for me. I told one lady, I said, you know, the church, the church is kind of like Noah's Ark. Some of it stinks, but it's the only thing afloat. You better get in. I actually thought that was funnier than it went across. But anyway. <laughs> so next, stay unified with fivefold ministry. I've already quoted Ephesians 4, that part. Stay unified with fivefold ministry. There's a trend in, in, in church today, and I'm not critical of, of new things and New concepts as long as they're biblical. But pastors, you need evangelists. Evangelists need a pastor. I believe we need apostles. Well, Brother Mike, I don't think there are any apostles anymore. Well, you believe what you want to believe. There's not the apostle, apostles of the Lamb anymore. They're with the Lord. But I don't find anywhere in the Scripture where Jesus allowed two of his fingers on his hand to be cut off. I don't think the Lord's walking around with two amputees and three fingers on his hand. The apostle and the prophet left. Say, well, Brother Micah, you know, in our churches, we don't have apostles and prophets. That's because you dishonored them, and whatever you dishonor leaves. Well, there's a lot of false prophets. Well, I've met a few false pastors. Come on. False teachers, false evangelists. Come on, just because there's a counterfeit doesn't disauthenticate the original. In fact, the counterfeit authenticates the original. You can't have a counterfeit $100 bill if there hadn't been a real one. So, in other words, let me make this very deep and profound. If you have $1 million in $100 bills and 100,000 of them are counterfeit, keep the 900 grand. So, stay connected to five-fold ministry. We need that. Number next, stay united with the constitution of the kingdom. How many notice I talk kingdom talk? What is the constitution of the kingdom? The word of God. God's word. I don't know what you believe. I think I know what you believe about the Bible, but I'll tell you what I believe. I believe it is inspired of God, every word of it. I believe it is inerrant. I believe it is infallible. I believe it is the constitution of the kingdom. I believe that when heaven and earth pass away, his word will not pass away. I believe that it is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. I believe it's the only thing that can divide sword, uh, soul and spirit. I believe it is settled in heaven. I believe he's watching over his word to perform it. I believe it's the only thing that will bring faith and the only thing that God will honor above his name is his word. You know what it says that in the Bible? I have magnified my word above my name. So however you preach it, preach it according to your gifts if you're in fivefold ministry. Teach it according to your style that God has given you. But for God's sake, leaders, let's get back to teaching our people the word of God. I don't know if you feel the pathos in me when I say that, but there's things coming in our nation that if the word of God is not dwelling richly in the heart of our people, they'll not be able to stand. Nothing will take its place. Stay united with it. I don't believe what I believe. 
And I don't stop believing what I believe because any man or woman says so. I ask this question, is it constitutional in the kingdom? Paul said the people at Berea were more noble than they at Thessalonica. Why? Because they searched the scripture to see if what Paul said was true. Can I just speak for me? You, anyone here has a right to search the scripture and hold me accountable to the word of God. Hold me accountable to the word of God. Preach the word, he said. And if you do, you'll be instant in season, out of season. If you do, you'll reprove. If you do, you'll rebuke. If you preach the word, you'll exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. If you preach the word, you'll do the work of an evangelist. If you preach the word, you'll make full proof of your ministry. It's not a list. It's one. Preach the word, and all these other things will flow out. Oh, praise God. This is a good group. I feel, I feel revelation here. Hallelujah. Next. You know, you're seeing a miracle. I'm really moving through these quickly. Don't ever see you say you've never seen a miracle. I spent less than 15 minutes on honor. That's like parting the Red Sea because it's a major revelation in my life. Stay united with your assignment. Let me say that a different way. Stay united with, stay united with your assignment. What is your assignment? What's your assignment from God, whether you're in five-fold ministry or not? Be proactive on my God-given assignment rather than being reactive to people-driven assignments. Come on, think about this. How many have discovered, whether you're in five-fold ministry or not, how many of you have discovered that everybody knows what you ought to do? Everybody knows what your assignment ought to be. If you don't believe it, I had some training in my youth in martial arts. Please don't come to me after service tell me I'm demon-possessed because I did that. I'm not. I didn't have any master but Jesus. It was just good, solid karate, and we enjoyed kicking the soup out of one another. Well, that's violent. You bet your life. In fact, I get an adrenaline rush every time I think about it. And uh, you've got to understand your assignment. Have you ever noticed you go to a martial arts match or you go to a boxing match, and, and, and there'll be a guy on the second row that had to buy three seats because he's that big, and he sits in the three seats with jumbo Dr. Pepper and popcorn and three hot dogs, and as soon as the fight starts, he's giving instruction to these two superbly trained athletes in the ring. Front snap kick, you know, roundhouse. You know, I'm always wanting them to stop right in the middle of it. You know, these guys, they can do a spinning back fist and hit you in the ear at 35 miles an hour. And this guy that needs help getting up is telling them how to throw the spinning back fist. I know we're close, but not. And you always want the guys to stop and say, come on, big boy. Get up in the ring. You know how to, everybody knows how to tell you to, how to fight your fight. Ministers, we got to be careful about this. Just because what works in our ministry doesn't mean that the other person in the other church has to do it that way. Come on, I'm preaching better than you're, you're shouting now. You have a, my way, my way. No, uh, 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 you're not Frank Sinatra or Paul Anka. I did it my way. That's God's definition of sin. Each one is turned, turned unto his own way. You've got to be careful with that. What works on the West Coast may not work in Georgia. What works in the city may not work in the country. Come on. What works in one culture may not work. Now, certain things always work. The blood of Jesus, the word of God, the love of God. But there's diversities in here. There's, come on, there's plenty of room on this ship for a lot of different assignments. Come on, let's get off of one another's back and start guarding one another's back. Let's learn how to honor each other's styles, each other's ministries. Well, it's just not my cup of tea. Well, enjoy some coffee. It's different than you. That's all right. 
Do you hear my heart tonight? Your assignment. Galatians 1.10, do I now persuade men or God? Do I seek to please men or seek to please God? Don't be a reactor to people's driven assignments. Be a responder to God's given assignment. Anybody watch Kentucky Derby this year? A couple of you. 2019 Kentucky Derby. Maximum security. He was the favorite. He was the best. Had a great name, Maximum Security. He led wire to wire, but he didn't win. He came across first, but he didn't win because your name doesn't matter, your fame doesn't matter, your pedigree doesn't matter, the applause doesn't matter. The only things that matters is did you run lawfully and please three stewards that were watching from above. And in the home stretch, maximum security edged into another horse and fouled that horse. He would have beat the horse anyway. He was the best. He had the best DNA, the best trainers, best owners. He went across first, but there's three stewards in the Kentucky Derby that's watching from the top. And they disqualified him because no man is crowned for the mastery unless he run lawfully. And we have three watching us from above. Come on, somebody. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is watching. I'm accountable. I'm accountable. I'm accountable. So if I get out of unity and I foul my brother... I get out of unity, and I'm so busy being successful in my ministry that I slight him. I'll be disqualified. Come on, folks. We've laughed tonight, and we've enjoyed ourselves, and that's good. But this is serious stuff. This is serious stuff. The older I get, the less critical I want to be of somebody else. Now, if they're in heresy, I mean, we'll talk about some of that tomorrow. I, I mean, I'll expose heresy, but I don't have to throw him under the bus. I'm ashamed. I'm going to go ahead and say it. I'm not going to call names. And don't try to figure it out because there's multiple examples. But I'm ashamed a lot of the men of God that get on TV and throw one another under the bus. This ought to stop. I said this ought to stop. And no man is so big in his ministry that he shouldn't be accountable to somebody. Somebody ought to be able to get up in your face and get up in your business and say, you're out of order. Stop this nonsense. People that, you know, just because it's not your lane doesn't mean you need to throw them under the bus. God's using them and you're in that lane. Respect that lane. Come on, somebody, grab this. I don't even know why I'm going here right now. But just, come on, man, let's get off of that. Let's get off of that. Well, I'll tell you some of these, I'll tell you, some of these preachers that teach sowing and reaping, they're hurting us. No, they're not. They're helping people get their harvest that is reaping the harvest. Yeah, there's phonies, but there's real ones too. Stay in your lane. Well, some of these healing evangelists, no, 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 no. Stay in your lane. You ought to have an, enough relationship with them to be able to go to them privately if you've got a problem with them. If you think that's false doctrine, come on, I'm teaching truth here. If you think it's false doctrine, you can correct the doctrine without throwing them under the bus. Folks, we've got enough people trying to destroy us. Let's not join the group. If you're my brother, I'm for you. I'm not going to foul you. I'm not going to push you into the rail so I can win. Any minister or, or Christian that thinks they can build their ministry or their Christianity by hurting others, needs to go back to the cross. We need a good dip in the love of God again. Come on, generationally we need to stop this thing. I'm trying to get off of this, but I really feel like it needs to be said. We need to stop this generational stuff in the church. Well, these young people don't know what they're doing. Come on, man. I had a lady walk up to me and she said, these young people are really strange today. I said, come on, I know you. We were both teenagers in the 60s. Have you looked at some of your pictures from the 60s? I said, go get them out of the trunk and look at some of your pictures. You talk about strange. Come on. Boof. 
savant hairdos that look like the leaning tower of Pisa. If you lean this way, you're going to sit on that side of the church. Come on, Crystal had one. I don't know if she did. I can assure you Mike didn't. <laughs> that maybe you did. That's why it fell out. And I don't know. Anyway. You know, it, folks, this generational thing. And, and the young people toward the, toward the older ones. Oh, you're just not with the current trend, baby. You're just not hip, baby. Hey, baby, we were hip before you were born. You just don't know what hip is. We were the hippies before the hipster. You understand what I'm saying? Come on. By this will all men know that you are my disciples because you love one another. I love young people. I love young people. I'm 67 years young, but I love young people. And you know what? I go into camp. I'm still doing, I still get invited to do youth camps every once in a while. I go do youth camps. I don't wear my tie and my vest. I wear, I bought me jeans with holes in them. I brought them home. My wife almost fell out. What are those? I said, they're cool jeans, baby. Now, they aren't very skinny jeans because I don't look good in skinny jeans. I don't look, you, you wouldn't either. You wouldn't go look good in skinny jeans. And the way you move, you'd probably have an accident up there. I mean, we're laughing here, but come on, do you understand what I'm saying? Come on, let's get in love with each other again. If we're going to have some unity, let's love each other again. Let's give some latitude of things, man. In the important things, let's have uniformity. But in the things that aren't important, let's have latitude and diversity. And in everything, let's have some love. Amen? That's what we've got to do. Don't, let, don't be people-driven. Be spirit-led. God decides my assignment. i got to decide to end here pretty quick. God decides my assignment, but I have to discover my assignment. God knows the plan he has for me, but I have to find out what it is. Can you, can you give your divine assignment in one sentence? Now, if we were in one of my protege conferences, my proteges would be nervous because I start walking like this. And they know I'm going to go buy one of them and I'm going to put the mic in front of there and say, give me your divine assignment in one sentence. Well, they've been protege very long. They'll have it. I know what mine is. My assignment is by preaching, teaching, modeling, and mentoring to impart the strength and wisdom of God into the body of Christ to move them from their current level of productivity in the kingdom to their next level. That's what I do. That's what I did last week in Cape Town, South Africa with about 1,500 leaders. That's what I'm doing here in St. Simon's Island. That's what I'll do when I go to the next place. Now, I win the lost? Yes. All of us ought to be soul winners. I pray for healing? Yes. Believers shall lay hands on the sick. But my particular assignment is by preaching, teaching, modeling, and mentoring to impart the strength and wisdom of God into the body of Christ to move them from their current level of productivity in the kingdom to their next level. That's what I do. That's why I don't have a nervous breakdown. I know who I am. I know what I do. Come on, somebody. I'm not testing. Testing one, two, three, four. Maybe I'm this. Maybe I'm that. No, no. I'm this. I know my lane. I'm not trying to get in somebody else's lane. I'm staying in my lane. I'm honoring their life. If they fall, I'll pick them up and we'll run the rest of the race together. But they're going to stay in their lane. I'm going to stay in mine. Amen? Do you know your assignment? So important. Sameness creates comfort, but uniqueness schedules success. You got to find out what your unique assignment is. Come on, y'all with me? I'm about to quit. You, re you receiving this? Find your uniqueness. I want to say that again. Sameness creates comfort. If you do the same thing as everybody else in your church, people coming into your church that's used to that thing will be comfortable. But you won't get any new folk. You won't reach the new generation. Come on. 
Brother Mike, I don't like lights and smoke. It's not my favorite gig either. But some of my young sons in the faith have used lights and smoke and flashing lights. They still preach Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit and they're seeing drug addicts delivered. So turn on the lights, baby. Go with it. I mean, you know, I was raised to wear a suit in church, but I can put on my holy jeans and still be holy. I put on my holy jeans. I can have my shirt. That's, that's their stream. So I just get with their stream. I looked down the other day. I was in Houston, Texas. Beautiful Hispanic, uh, a whole row of Hispanics there in Houston. And one guy had a big tattoo. He was bald, had a tattoo of, 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 of looked like a demon, supposedly, on top of his head. And another guy had this, another guy had that. You know what, man? I was able to preach to them. I laughed with them. They laughed with me. I led one of them to Jesus that morning. Come on, guys. We, we're a, we got to be about the Father's business here. We've got to be willing. We've got to be willing to, to adapt here. Sameness creates comfort, uniqueness. What's unique about your church? What's unique about your church? What's unique about your ministry? What's unique about your business? McDonald's was first, round hamburgers, golden arches. Then came Wendy's. They couldn't put up golden arches, and round hamburgers was the same thing, so people would go to McDonald's. So what they do? They said, our hamburgers are square, and that makes them juicier. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. Square or round makes them juicier. But Wendy's took a surge when they made their hamburgers square because people want uniqueness. You understand? And then came Burger King. Well, we can't make square hamburgers. Wendy's got that. We can't have golden arches round hamburgers. Well, McDonald's got that. So uh, we'll, we'll flame broil our hamburgers. We're not going to fry them. We're going to flame broil them. And they're not just burgers. They're whoppers. Come on. And then Chick-fil-A came along under the anointing and beat them all. Hallelujah. I love that. I would advise you, and this is, I'll make a disclaimer here, but if you ever have an opportunity to have a Chick-fil-A franchise and you can afford it, baby, it might be a real good idea. I told some businessmen in Cape Town, South Africa, I said, has Chick-fil-A got here yet? They said, not yet. I said, watch with great anticipation. And when they do, get that franchise because KFC will lose some business. Why? Uniqueness. Let me ask you this question. I'm going to close here in a minute. Why do you try to be like everybody else? I hope, you, I hope you know I love you. I'm not trying to mess with you here. I'm just trying to make you think a little bit about this. Why do we have to be like everybody else? I come from that 1960s generation. You know what we said? Do your own thing. We're doing our own thing. Trouble is, we did it all alike. Wear our hair alike, wear the same day. We did. Do your own thing. It was all alike. There was no really individuality to it. But why, why do we have to be? Paul is different than Peter. Peter is different than John. You read it in their writing, John, beloved, let us love God. He that is born of God loveth God. Loveth God. It's, you can smell the flowers. James is sarcastic. You believe there's a God, you're like a demon. Demons believe that. <laughs> Paul's explosive. I got the name of the gospel of Christ. Elijah is a prophet of Jeremiah has no fire. He has tears. All these different folk. This is what makes up the body of Christ. And folks, if we can't learn to honor one another's differences. Jordan, go up there and begin to play. If we can't learn to honor one another's differences. I talked to my brother. I haven't seen him in a long time. And I, I saw him in Richmond, Indiana. Several years ago when I was preaching in conference there, I said, you were a missions director up there. He said, still am. He said, been, been in missions, what, 36? 36 years. Wow. I need to honor anybody that's been in missions for 36 years. 
I mean, I look around and I see all kinds of different ministries here. Some of you preach from big wooden pulpits. I took Michael McNamee, who was an ex-IRA terrorist in the 70s, on a Speed the Light tour at that time, which was raising money for missions. He was an ex-IRA terrorist that had got born again, had to hide from the IRA. He had this rich Irish brogue. You know the Irish, they go up at the end of every sentence. You would think they're asking a question every time they talk to you. And Michael was that way, and we went to this new church. They just finished it, and they were so proud of it. They loved it. It was nice. <laughs> Michael got up and he looked at it and he said, is this what you call a pulpit in America? In Ireland, we call it a boat. <laughs> but he laughed and then he honored. Some of you, some of you preach from big wooden pulpits. And some of you preach from smaller white lecterns. And some of you have a flat table, a flat table. And it's got a high stool beside it. And you can put your iPad on it. And this. Some of you use PowerPoint, some of you don't. You understand what I'm saying? As long as Jesus is being lifted up, as long as the Word of God is being preached, as long as there's love, as long as we're winning souls, as long as there's a transformation in the house, now, I have problems with form when formulas take the place of transformation. I want transformation. We'll talk about tomorrow some things we don't unify with. Do you know unity does not unify with everything? But I just felt like bringing this tonight, and I'm through teaching. I can pick this up tomorrow. And it may seem like a strange shift but the Spirit of God, when I was in Pastor Mike's office before service, spoke to me again that word that he spoke to me last night. And I want to deal with that just a moment, and then I want to pray for people tonight. We all have stories we can tell. One of my friends says, you see the glory, but you don't know the story. We all have stories, tough stories. I was raised in a preacher's home. I'm glad I was. I'm not bitter over it. I had wonderful parents. Mom went home two years ago at the age of 96, and Dad went home seven years ago at the age of 91. I honor their memory. The other day I was driving, and my thought went, I'm going to call Dad. Crazy. He's been gone seven or eight years. I'm going to call Dad, reach for the phone, talk, well, can't, can't, would love to talk to him. But I have some, I have some memories that might have made it hard for me to stay in unity with the body of Christ. I remember when I was going to Bible college and I was 19 years old. Is it okay if I tell you this and then pray for you? Because the Lord told me in the office in there, he said, the word I gave you last night when you were just introducing what you're going to teach that there have been people severely wounded. And there have been entrances made by wounds. And I'm going to heal those wounds this week. But I'm not going to scar them over. I'm going to leave them open. Because that which the enemy meant to enter to destroy is going to be the exit portal for the anointing that's in them to come out. And you've prayed for God to scar it over. He didn't want to scar it over. When Jesus came out of the tomb, his wound was still open, but it was healed. He said to Thomas, thrust your hand in my side. Put your fingers in the holes of my hand. If they were scarred, he couldn't have done that. And I feel this so strong, but I want to tell this story, and then we're going to pray over you, and we're going to believe God. I love revival atmosphere and shouting and jubilee and all of that. I love that. But I don't feel that tonight. I feel, I feel like the Lord really wants to do some deep healing in our lives and some deep healing in the lives of leaders. It's hard for you to stay in unity because you've been wounded and you're suspicious. 
There isn't a tenth gift of the Spirit called the gift of suspicion. That's a work of the flesh. It really is. I came home, Pastor Mike, when I was 19 years old. I was studying in Bible college. I was preaching every weekend. But I came home one weekend to be with Dad and Mom. Went to church. Came home to their lovely home. Dad and Mom had worked hard, and finally they had a real pretty home. Mom loved cream color, kind of cream color carpet. Almost white, but not quite white. She loved that. She'd finally got that cream color carpet she liked. She had little knickknacks that she collected. She was a collector, you know, and she had them all over the house. And it meant a lot to my mom. We came home from church one Sunday night, and we walked in the house. And when we got there, we saw the door had been split open, so we walked in carefully. We, they were gone. And there was red paint all over mom's cream-colored carpet, splashed out of buckets. There was obscenities written in red paint on the walls next to the holes where fist had punched through them. All of mom's little breakable porcelain knickknacks had been taken and thrown on the floor and smashed. I won't get into all the details, but they had used the living room as a bathroom. They had stolen things, broken the TV out, vandalized. Say, oh, terrible criminals. No church people church people many of them had been born again under my dad's ministry years before they got bitter against him about something and they'd left the church they used to call him up and breathe heavy in the phone and make threats I found out who was leading that and sometimes mercy is the answer and sometimes a phone call is the answer and I just explained to him that while I loved him, I loved my mom and dad more. And if we got any more of this happening, I was going to be knocking on his door. And it wasn't about soul winning. And if you don't like that, I'm sorry, but that's I meant every word of it. I'm not going to treat my mom that way anymore. I'm not going to have it. I'm not going to have it. And I walked in, I saw all that, and mom's heart just crushed, just broke. Dad was tough. He had fought the Japanese in World War II. He's a tough guy. But I could see his heart was broken. I guess I should have got out of the ministry. I should have just quit. I should have just thrown in the towel. Have you had anybody that you poured your life into that became your Judas? Have, have you raised a lot of money, millions of dollars, for a project and then never heard from the man again when he told you he'd always be in covenant with you and then have him blackball you to his churches <laughs> see we're not supposed to talk about these things are we we're supposed to act like it's you know the wizard of oz we're in oz no there's real negative things that happen I've seen people get up out of wheelchairs in my meetings. Documented miracles of fourth stage cancer healed, medically documented. But our firstborn son is about 40 years old now, and he's still in his wheelchair with the most severe case of cerebral palsy that you can have. Cortically blind, hydrocephalic, no cognitive recognition ability. No relational ability, can't know me as dead. I don't talk about this a lot. I'm just being transparent because I feel like this is what the Lord wants me to do. Has had to have full-time medical care in a beautiful facility run by Christians in more of a home environment. But he has to have a doctor there all the time, has to have nurses around him. Wasn't supposed to have even lived as long as he's lived. Quadriplegic. I guess I should just quit preaching on divine healing. I guess I should just get bitter that those I've loved a lifetime have turned and gone another way. And I've left to face the midnight when it hurt too much to pray. You ever been there? 
And when your reputation had been stained and your mind won't understand, a friend of mine wrote these words, and you got nothing left but God, you've got enough to start again. There's real conflict in church leadership. There's a price to pay. Jesus did not pay it all. I said Jesus did not pay it all. He paid it all for our salvation. But there will be a price to pay for the anointing. I don't know why the Lord just reined me up in the office and said, Michael, I want you to tell them about some of those things tonight. Because some of them can't be in unity because they've been wounded in the past so much that they can't commit now. And he said, if you'll tell them, I'm there to heal them. A friend of mine wrote this song, and I'm going to pray over you after I tell you about it. He said, scars, he said, broken but mended again. Broken but mended again. I love this line. And scars just remind me that grace always finds me. I was broken, but I mended again. And then he wrote a follow-up song, and it was this. I want to spend my life mending broken people. I want to spend my life removing pain. Lord, let my words heal the heart that hurts. I want to spend my life mending broken. So, and this is my 52nd year of ministry. I don't have any bitterness in me anymore. I don't want to get back at anybody anymore. And if you knew me in my flesh, I remember things. You say, Brother Mike, that's bad. Well, your flesh ain't too sweet either, baby. Any flesh that's out from under the leadership of the Spirit of God will make a mess out of our lives. But Brother Mike, I don't have any bitterness anymore in my life. I haven't had it for a long time. Our firstborn son has all those problems because the doctor made a grievous error. It was proven. I don't even know if that doctor's still alive, but if he was today, and if he was on St. Simon's Island, I could buy him supper and sit with him and there'd be no bitterness in my heart against that man. And that's not Mike Brown because I'm, I'm prophetic and prophetic people want justice. Justice is big to us. And I'm just here to tell you and I'm through now that Jesus healed me of my bitterness. Jesus vacuumed out all of that vengeance out of my life. And will anything ever go negative or wrong? Or will people do me wrong again? Probably. Probably. But nobody has put nails in my hands. And nobody has driven a spear into my side. And he said, Father, forgive them. So I've shifted the way the Lord told me to shift. And you're here tonight, and you want to be in unity, but sometimes you can only reach a certain place, and you can't go any further, because you've been deeply wounded. The Lord said for me to tell you tonight that the healer is here to heal you of your wounds. He won't close them. He'll leave them open. So the anointing it created in you can leave you and destroy yokes in other people's lives. Anybody grateful for that? Come on, lift up your hands. Oh, praise God. Just come on, just begin to praise Him with your voice a little bit. Come on, let's just do this. Let's just spend a little time. Come on, just praise Him with your voice. Pour your healing oil through me pour your healing oil through me like 
like a river of love. Pour your healing. Pour it down from above. Pour your healing oil through me. Thank you, Lord. I want to sing that again. And as I sing it, just let the Lord do that right now. Pour your healing oil through me. Pour, pour your healing oil through me. Let him do it. Let him do it. Like a river, like a river of love, Lord, I need you to pour your healing. Pour it down from above. Pour your healing. Pour your healing. Pour your he healing oil through me. Like a river, like a river of love. Pour your healing, I need it from above. Pour your healing oil through me. That's what the master does. Like a river of love, pour your healing from above. Pour your healing oil through me. In meetings like this, we can take a little time. We can be together. And we can let his healing oil flow through us. I'm not a rookie, but I need his oil more than I've ever needed it before. I need his healing more than I've ever needed it before. And there is something in this 67-year young man that wants to express the healing of Jesus. Those of you in five-fold ministry particularly, listen to me. We're going to go in a few minutes, but listen. Every time you stand in front of people, on every row, there's a broken heart. On every row. And you may think it's your home folk and it's not, you know, well, I know them. You really don't know everything in there. There's brokenness in people. There's brokenness in people. And I believe the Lord is bringing us into a place in the church. That's why he's wanting us to come into unity. Because the way he ministers healing to one another is through the other joint. Each joint supplies the other. Each joint supplies the other. Young blonde hair, older gray hair, each one. See, this is the body. And this is what America must see. They're not impressed with our programs. Can I just say this to you? You can't compete with Broadway or Hollywood. They'll beat you. They have more money. 
they've been at it then over there. I'm not against doing our best and having excellence and technology and everything and the programs and the dramas, and I've done all that. It's all good. But what we have to offer that no one else has to offer is a love that heals everything, transforms everything, changes everything, takes young ladies that have had abortions and not only forgives them but removes the post-abortion syndrome. Folks, we can't scream against abortion if we can't love the abortionists. If we can't love the ladies that have gone through it, we can't do that. So I hope you feel my heart while I'm preaching and teaching to you this week. I didn't come to try to impress you with theology. I didn't come to tell my, about my degrees or where I've gone and what I've done and all of that. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to serve Jesus. But I really want to touch your lives this week. And I pray that when this meeting is over, that FCMI will be more unified than it's ever been. And that we'll love each other more than we've loved each other. And we'll give way to latitude and differences and not separate ourselves because of it. Don't separate yourselves. Don't. Remember Ben. I quoted him today. We must hang together or we most assuredly will hang separately. So we're going to hang together. Amen. I don't know who's going to close this out or if I'm going to close it out or whatever needs to be done. But are you glad you came tonight? Glad you came. Give the Lord praise. Give the Lord. Father God, we're so grateful, Lord God, for you meeting with us here, Lord. I thank you what took place, Lord, in our heart and in, our, in the invisible, Lord God. We will feel and receive, Lord. Uh, Lord, the ramifications in the days to come. And Lord, I thank you for your work. I thank you, Lord God, for your grace. Thank you, Lord, for your blessing upon each one. Lord, thank you for sending Dr. Brown our way. And we ask tonight, Lord God, you be with each family. Just ask, Lord God, you bless those that are traveling tonight. Lord, you give grace in Jesus' name. Amen.